and welcome to the Blue Gamer Bluecast. It's been a while. Um, it is, uh, what, probably June 30th, 2016, Madam Blue, uh, just by myself. Yeah, I know. No, I, I, I haven't done a podcast in forever, and uh, the Bluecast, actually, and I just need to get this started back up. Even if I just do quick little 30-minute things uh, here and there, I just need to get this done. I'm, I just do. Uh, it's, it's been eating me up inside. I haven't been posting as much as I want to on my blog. A lot of this has to do with family, uh, work. I've really got a, uh, a job right now. That's, that was a great job. Uh, just, it takes up time, but, um, I mean, actually the truth is I come home and I just play video games all the time and, uh, there's usually no time for me to record without hearing, um, all the kids screaming. So yes, I am doing this from a secret location. At a secret time, no one knows I'm here, actually. Um, so yeah, let's get right to this. Um, yeah, so uh, just a little quick thing. So and I've been doing Blue Gamer stuff for like 10 years. You know, and it hasn't taken off. It hasn't like got to a point to where I'm making money off of this. I'm spending my time talking about games, not making money off of it. Uh, and if I do, it's very little. But I I just want to keep going, you know, Um this is just what I like to do. I need to talk about games, and uh, I, I figure I just need to keep going uh, and, and to eventually get a, a following going. I know um, uh, for a while I was doing the Souls cast, so I was really into Dark Souls. It was really hard for me to... It felt like a lot of work for me to get the time to do it with uh, with my buddy Shane, um, who's doing the solo Souls cast. Well, I'll have to put this in um, in the description for you can find the solo Souls cast. It just, it was hard for me to find the time, you know, where he was available, I was available for us to do this. Another thing is I'm kind of picky about quality uh, when it comes to mics. My preference is for the people of the podcast to all be in the same room with $200 mics. And, you know, that's, it's not going to happen right now. Uh, I did do that in the past, uh, shortly, when the uh, the Bluecast was on a radio station, Um but uh, I, I want to get that start started back up again, and you know, so I'll just do it like this, and we'll see where it goes. And that's basically it. So, uh, any input, any uh, suggestions anyone has, just let me know. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So, what have I been playing um, since Dark Souls Three? Since I completed that uh, shortly after it came out, and this happens with any Souls game, you kind of get into this uh, into this kind of depressive phase where no game is as good. There's just no game that's as good as a Souls game, right? Well, I actually got around that by playing Nintendo games because you can't say a Souls game is better than than a Nintendo game. These games are just completely different from each other. Um, And in a lot of ways, uh, this comes down to mechanics, environment, atmosphere. Um, It just puts me in a different mindset when I play a Nintendo game. Therefore, um... Uh, I'm able to play without worrying about it not being as good as Souls. So this started with the Kirby uh, Planet Robobot. If that's the full name, where is the... Uh... Yeah, Kirby Planet Robobot. Um, it's good. It is good. Yeah, I mean, I love all the Kirby side scrollers. They're great. Um, Triple Deluxe that came out before uh, on the 3DS is amazing. And Robobot is is just the same. So... What's cool about Robobot is, as the name implies, there's a lot of robots, basically robot, uh, some robot, uh, I, you know, I haven't been following the story, but basically Kirby's Planet's taken over by robots, so everything's like mechanical. Um, same, same basic gameplay, except every once in a while, uh, you can jump into a mech that can also, uh, take powers from enemies, and, um, and yeah. I mean, that, it doesn't happen all the time, but every once in a while throughout the levels, they'll have a, a mech scattered. So, it's interesting what this game does. I don't know if it does it on purpose or Nintendo does this on purpose, but if you were just to go from the beginning to the end of a level of the entire Kirby game, it's pretty simple. Kids, any child will have fun with this. What I think they do good here is uh, the completionist side of it. Getting, uh, For instance, they have these cubes, these data cubes. I, I don't remember what they're called exactly. Um, but in order to get these cubes, um, uh, they're hidden. And later in the game, it's crazy how hidden they are and what you actually have to do. Because sometimes it will span a level with multiple paths. So um, I'll restart a level 
And sometimes I'll just be like, F it, I'll just complete the level and come back and do it later. Because they really did a good job of um, of the cubes. Now, um, for now, I'm actually at the last boss. I haven't beaten the last boss yet. I, I went to the last boss on the first try. I, I play it horribly. Because the game is kind of easy, I tend to just play uh, non-strategically. I just kind of mash buttons uh at a boss but in this kirby game the boss does require some strategy to it um this last boss so i'll have to it's probably the hardest part of the entire game really and it's really not too tough but i'll have to get back to that um and then also star fox zero uh i I love star fox Uh, i want to say i love star fox i loved it on the super nintendo and n64 uh what they did since then never really cared for uh assault dinosaur planet command what have you um, so, with this one, it was very interesting. Platinum Games making it, but using the gamepad, but at the same time, it's Star Fox. So, I went ahead and got it. And I will say, it is a fun game. This Star Fox game plays like you would expect Star Fox to play. Okay? Um, and that's good. It, it, except that, when you go into all range mode, if you remember that, um, where you can kind of, you know, fly around with the R-Wing wherever you want. Um, the the game wants you to focus on the gamepad because then it's in first person and you use the gamepad's gyro to aim. Um, in a way of what uh, some other games do like uh, Splatoon, except Splatoon's a little different. You can actually just use the gyro to kind of make more precise... Uh, shots based on where you're already aiming or I guess you can just use it fully from what I understand. I just in Star Fox for me it doesn't work because the perspective is supposed to be of inside the ship. Right? But you lose that feeling of being the R Wing when you're actually looking down at the gamepad in in first person view using the gyroscope to aim. It uh uh, first of all, it's disorienting going from a third-person view based on the craft to a first-person view on the gamepad. So first, my mind, and it could be me, maybe I'm slow, but when I'm getting onto the gamepad, I'm for a second, I'm like, okay, now i got to reorient myself to to be aiming differently. But then once I do that, um, it actually goes pretty well. The thing is, sometimes when I want to look up and see what's going on on the screen, and then sometimes I look at the screen, I'm like, man, I'd rather be able to play like this. This reminds me of... So what, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't add anything new as far as improvements go. It's really just a, a cool little feature. Uh, unfortunately, this feature takes over the majority of the game. Um, so it, for me, this game uh, is... Is highly controversial to myself and to others, but for me especially because when you're doing Star Fox gameplay, it is awesome Star Fox gameplay, awesome secrets, uh, little secret things to do, you know, you get the medals and all that, uh, but then when it's not Star Fox and when it's when it's uh, first person aiming on the, the gamepad, it just, it feels like I'm locked into some mini game that I'd rather not play, so... Here's hoping that with the NX, whatever the NX is, that they uh, maybe do a remaster where they just make it to where you don't need uh, a second screen, where you can just play it like you would be playing on the N64, except um, you're playing it uh, without that second screen. So, let's see. Uh, Moving on, uh, someone wanted to mention, speaking of Kirby and Wii U, I actually got... Uh, because I'm about to be playing at Robobot and I'm on this Kirby kick, I went ahead and got Rainbow Curse because I never played it originally. Only because when I ended up looking at previews and stuff, I saw that it wasn't a typical side-scroller. It was basically a game that can actually just be on a a, a uh, touch device because you just use the pen and you just draw, and that's how you control Kirby. Now, you can have other players come and do local co-op, but it's just essentially just you draw on it and it's it's funny because this game really could just be on a phone and it would work but it is an excellent game i i feel with how big mobile is and how far mobile devices have come with the shift in gaming going to mobile devices not one developer has been able to make a touchscreen game 
as good as uh, Kirby Rainbow Curse. It is just fun as hell. One one thing I really like about it is it's actually very difficult. Um, I do have a hard time uh, sometimes when I'm drawing the path for Kirby to be on. Like the direction you draw is the direction he will go when he touches it. The thing is. At any time, Kirby, as a little ball, could be rolling in whatever direction. And if you touch him, he just goes faster in that direction. So you have to, like, draw to get him to turn around, so then you can draw to get him on the the canvas or the rainbow uh, path, I guess, you want him to be on. And and it takes some getting used to. And even when you get used to it, it's just it's very interesting because you're not controlling Kirby. You're drawing lines to keep him on that. Anyway, if... Just like uh, the other Kirby games, you know, there's a lot of stuff to collect, and it's fun to figure out how you draw to get Kirby to all the secret items. Uh, it, it did a great job with it. I'm only in the second world. I am doing horrible. I think only the first level, maybe I got all the little secrets that are in there, but other than that, I'm having a hard time, and that's good. I, I think it's really good that they made the game like this, and that slipped under my radar, and I recommend anyone with a Wii U to get this game, and it's crazy how many good games are really on the Wii U. It, it's just disappointing how Nintendo's dealing with it, but we'll we'll talk more about it later, maybe. Okay, and to get into some non-Nintendo stuff, b- recommended uh, by Cody, Duck Plunger, who's been on the ca- cast before, Party Hard um, is a game that's on Steam right now. Uh, it might be on other platforms, I'm not sure, but it's, think Hotline Miami, uh, but zoomed out all the way, and you can see everything. And no one can really fight back, but cops can come and get you. And the whole purpose of it is to, you go into this area, you're basically a neighbor that's annoyed by party, whether it's at a beach, at a house, at a club, and you're going in there to kill everybody without getting caught. So there could be like up to 50 um, people in a party, and you have to go in and set traps, uh, shift people. It's, it's actually pretty dark, <laughs> to be honest. But it is kind of fun just trying to think of how to how it works. So in this one run, you can kill everyone. Because if if you get caught or if if you slip up, it's the end and you have to start over again. And I think that's great because it's, it's made for that. If they had, like, checkpoints, you would kind of rush the game. So I really think about it when I start up a level for Party Hard. I'm thinking about, okay, what trap should I do first? What's going to get me... Most of these people killed and move on. And all of this sounds horrible out of context, but um, that game, I, I, it's recommended. And I want to say it's like on, you know, Steam Summer Sale going on right now. Um, it's probably on there and really cheap. Um, I forget how much I paid for it. That's how cheap cheap it was, really. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to go to some news uh, that's been going around. And some of this might be a little dated, but it's something I just really want to talk about. So, uh, for instance, Oculus. Rift. I don't know how many of you really pay attention to the VR stuff. I'm paying attention to it. I'm, it's not like I'm too excited about it, but I just really want to see where it goes, and it could change gaming. Um, so, basically, with the Oculus, it's now made apparent that it's kind of a closed ecosystem. Oculus games are for Oculus only. Uh, I guess someone tried to make uh, some mod or something so the Vive can play Oculus games. Um but their stance on it is that yeah, it's uh, it's a closed platform, um, and there's a few interesting things about this. VR could be the future, right? So some of the uh, if you think about the future of gaming, uh, especially on PC, who knows how it would take off on console? Because PC gaming can still be its uh, niche thing, and it happens like that. But um, I don't want that to be some sort of trend where, oh, it's a closed platform, other uh, competitors come out with their closed VR platform. You know, with the the way PC gamers are in the ecosystem works, I don't see that flying. Really, uh, you can buy Steam codes anywhere and then plug them into Steam. You know, Steam is just the way for people to access the game and buy the games. Uh, But, you know, mainly for uh, developers to be able to support and update their games. Um, so if that was to happen where VR, the future of gaming on PC was more of a closed platform than it has been, it's always been open, um, you know, and that, that wouldn't be a good thing and everyone would speak up and then it would change and it wouldn't be a closed platform anymore. What's interesting about this though is John Carmack, you know, he, you know, while he didn't start PC gaming, 
I think they did a kickstart to what PC gaming can be with, you know, uh, their properties, with its software uh, properties. And I think he's very smart. I've gone to QuakeCon many times, and I just listen to him speak. Half the time, I don't know what he's saying, but he's, he's highly intelligent. And um, I love to hear what he has to say. And so going to Oculus, to me, that's, that's a big deal. That means there is something here. If John Carmack is going to Oculus, that means there is something there. And it's interesting how it all started. It was basically um, when, I guess, while with Bethesda, um, John Carmack wanted to work with uh, Oculus to create Doom 3 um, for the Rift. And what's interesting about that is, you know, it's funny how people want to get Doom to run on anything. And so, you know, for John Carmack, it was really interesting for him to want to use, you know, VR, I guess, see what he can do with uh, Doom 3. And then I guess they started talking, and he probably got really excited, enjoyed, you know, all the new things with VR. And then, you know, eventually he ended up going to Oculus, and that kind of made Bethesda uh, a little mad. I think there's a lawsuit going on about that. Um, but I, I, I don't really want to get into lawsuits. But um, anyway, I think it's interesting that John Car- Carmack wanted to go uh, to Oculus. Uh, because I think you want to follow whatever this guy does. And so now that he's there, um, you know, Oculus is becoming this closed platform, which that's very interesting too. Um, I don't think, this is my personal opinion, I don't think the future of gaming is in VR, but I do think VR is going to have a future and it's going to have games. Uh, There's a reason Facebook picked up VR or Oculus Rift. If, if, Facebook was really wanting to get into gaming. They probably would have got Minecraft before MS. Facebook and MS or Microsoft are very close. Uh, they probably know what's going on. If Facebook really wanted Minecraft, they would have grabbed... If they wanted gaming, they would have grabbed Minecraft, I should say. So I think the point of VR is to be more uh, about the consumer use for or just a new kind of thing, like how computers came into the household and going on the Internet's a new thing. I really do see VR kind of being that in the future for whatever reason, whether it's people just want to be able to escape. They do a thing where they escape, and they're somewhere for 30 minutes a day, uh, or used for porn because you know how porn can help uh, new technologies kind of uh, be very successful, and I know a lot of uh, companies are going in that direction. I mean, at E3, there was a VR porn booth, so... but. When it comes to gaming, I don't think I think uh, John Carmack can maybe make some cool experiences, um, but I really don't think uh, VR is going to be the future of gaming. I just think VR is going to be in the future for sure, and there is going to be VR gaming. Um, anyway, my whole point of bringing that up is I just found it interesting where John Carmack has gone, and then my thoughts of where VR is in the future. And Microsoft, you would think they'd be on top of VR. I think they are, but in a way, they're going more towards uh, AR, um, which is a little different. Uh, it, it, it's more of to kind of manipulate what you're actually seeing and what's in front of you. Um, and I think there's going to be a combination of the VR and the AR, and I think Microsoft's looking more into that. Um, but yeah, so that's it for that. Um, so another topic I wanted to bring up, uh, or another news item was, uh, I guess... You know what, I really should do better research, but some listing came up somewhere for how the medium of a video game is listed or whatever. Uh, what, I, what I mean is Nintendo had, you know, if like Nintendo had a game listed, I guess maybe for a ratings board or something, I forget where I read this from. Nintendo would have like a Kirby game listed and it says, you know, what format it's in. It would be like download, uh, software, CD, I don't know, et cetera. For the new Zelda game, Breath of the Wild, they actually specifically uh, had cartridge in there, just like they do with their 3DS listings, which is interesting. And, you know, it made me think, like, would Nintendo go back to cartridges? You know, for one, it's like, did we ever see some sort of um, issue Nintendo having with with CD-based uh, software and I know there's nothing I saw unless it has to do with load times because I do think when you talk about next gen uh, one of my things is there should be no load times anymore but you know that's that's a whole other story um, I, I think 
by using cartridges, this kind of goes in with this rumor of the NX being both a, a console and a handheld so that you have a cartridge. And you could do it with a CD too, but if you're going to be moving something around, a cartridge is easier. I mean, with a 3DS also. Um, and you saw how the Vita went, or the PSP went to the Vita, uh, that different type of uh, format. So I, I would see cartridges being used for the NX because of the handheld aspect of it. And again, it could be just a docking station you plug the uh, little handheld into and you play games. I don't, I don't know. It's supposed to be something new and interesting. Miyamoto said something recently that they can't comment on what they're doing right now because it's new and different. Uh, but um, I, I think it would be really cool if cartridges came back. It, it, you, on one hand, I wouldn't see it coming back because I think digital is the future, even though I prefer uh, buying physical media. But I do think the sales still show that people buy retail um, a lot. Um, so I do think that um, it's very possible that uh, Nintendo could be releasing cartridges and, for the NX. And I, I can't wait to see what happens with that. I think that would be amazing. Um, so real quick, I wanted to touch on um, some of uh, my impressions of E3. So... E3 this year wasn't too exciting to me. Uh, I'll go down the list real quick. Um, we had uh, Nintendo just show off Zelda pretty much. And that was the most successful part of the show, which is very interesting. But yeah, Nintendo just showed off Breath of the Wild. And um, it looks good. Um, you know, any Zelda game is really going to look good to me. I just need to actually play it um, first. So then we had Sony. They showed off a ton of VR stuff, really. Um I guess they didn't really have any any games that really stood out to me as being amazing. They showed God of War, uh, but I just got to see what it does first because we know what God of War is, but this new one looked different. It was kind of this uh, um, third-person uh, kind of uh, cinematic look, which cinematic is the whole big thing. Um, and then other than that, they were showing off, you know, Horizon, New Dawn or whatever, um, and that actually... Um, that actually looks great. I mean, again, it just looks cool. Can't wait to play it. Uh, there's nothing more that could be said. Um, it, it, just this running theme I'm seeing is, you know, the game's just looking cinematic. I, I, I'm, and I know it's E3. There's, a, there's really a point to what's being shown in E3, but I'm more interested in. I want to see new AI. I want to see. I want to see those types of things being explored instead of just graphics, right? Or present or cinematic presentation. So. Uh, Microsoft had their uh, had their thing, and I really I, I like that they sh they have Dead Rising Four coming out. I love Dead Rising. Other than that, I can't really say there was much that really jumped out at me. Um, so there's a game called Near, right? So there's a game there's an RPG called Near. I've never played it. I don't really care. But Platinum is making the sequel, and they showed off gameplay for that, and that looked fantastic. It looked like an awesome action game. Um, what you'd expect from Platinum, despite uh, what happened with uh, Ninja Turtles and Star Fox. Oh my god, that Ninja Turtle game, can't believe you. It's like, it was a dream, I guess, for Platinum to make a Ninja Turtle game. It seemed obvious, and then the way it turned out. Uh, but, anyway, so yeah, E3, uh, to me, that it ended kind of on a depressing note. I don't really think there is anything that was a big deal. Um, Maybe next year will be exciting, because uh, by the end of the year, we're going to hear about the Neo, uh, and also the recently rumored Slim PS4 also. Uh, you know, the Xbox has their Xbox One S that's coming out, their Slim, and then uh, they announced the Scorpio coming out. And then, you know, Nintendo's got their NX. So these coming months, end of the year, TGS, I don't know when, PlayStation Experience, up until E3 next year, it's going to be full of all this new hardware. I just hope... In there, somewhere, we are seeing, I guess, a progression toward uh, what we experience in the game. And not in the cinematic or narrative way, but I mean uh, exploring gameplay mechanics to pull us in more. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with AI, environment, and, and stuff like that. So, all right, guys. Well, thanks for uh, joining me for this, uh, the, the Blue Gamer Bluecast. Like I said, I want to keep these short and... Um, I'm glad I got to um, uh, do this real quick and throw it up there. Let me know what you guys think. You can check me out uh, at bluegamer.net's the blog, Adam Blue on Twitter, 
um, all that jazz and whatever. So uh, we'll we'll uh, talk to you guys next time.